Chapter 12, Mongol Eurasia and its aftermath. This is part two. So we left off with the death of Chinggis Khan, and in his place, um, the man that rises to power is Kublai Khan, who is Chinggis's uh, grandson. Uh, he declares himself the founder of the Yuan Empire. So what is the Yuan Empire? Empire created in China and Siberia by Kublai Khan. Uh, he spread the empire even further by defeating the Song and Vietnam. Okay. Okay, the next section in our book, uh, our chapter is the Mongols and Islam. Uh, how did the Mongol expansion and Islam affect each other? So 1260, the Ilkhan Empire was was created. The Ilkhan state was established. So uh, does this cause, remember the Abbasid Caliphate? Uh, so this is, uh, this is the, you know, you're, you're mixing Islam and, and you're kind of starting with the relationship of the Mongols and Islam. Okay, so, so what is the Ilkhan? A secondary or peripheral Khan based in Persia. This is a Mongol Khan in Persia. Okay, the Ilkhan's Khanate was founded by Hulego, a grandson of Chinggis Khan, and was based at Tabriz in the Iranian province of Azerbaijan. I'm sorry, Azerbaijan. It controlled much of, of Iran and Iraq. So we've had caliphates, shogunates, and now we have khanates, all the same type of idea. Not necessarily a city, but more of a of an area that's under the rule or, or the you know the control of a certain person who was the in this case the khan. Okay, uh, in, the, in the other case in China it would be the in the, the shoguns. Um, okay, uh, so the. Uh, the uh, Ilkhan controlled Iran, uh, Azerbaijan, Mesopotamia, and parts of Armenia, which all the all those are in the present day Middle East. So a Khanate territory ruled by a Khan. So, like I said, similar to a, sh a Shogunate or a Caliphate, same thing. Uh, another notable Khanate of this era was the Golden Horde. This is a 1951. Um, a Hollywood film, uh, The Golden Horde of Genghis Khan, and this is a 19, a poster from the 1951 poster, I'm sorry, movie. Uh, so the presence of a Mongol Khanate in the Middle East led to an interaction between the Mongols and Islam. Uh, they became political rivals of each other, had many conflicts, and this resulted in a Mongol invasion by a Khanate called the Golden Horde. Uh, so who were they, according to your book? Uh, the Mongol Khanate, founded by Chinggis Khan's grandson Batu, was based in southern Russia and quickly adopted both the Turkish language and Islam, also known as the Kipchak Horde. Uh, the presence of these two Khanates put pressure on the Muslim states. And you have this this rivalry. Uh, the Ilkhan state controlled much of the Middle East, the Golden Horde, southern Russia. This creates religious tensions between Mongols and Muslims. Uh, and the cause, of course, is the is the conflict between the Ilkhan and the Golden Horde. Uh, so you have the Ilkhan with the Pope, uh, the Golden Horde with the Mamluks, and this all has an impact on the Crusades. This is all happening around that same time. Uh, Okay, so you have so so you, you have these two uh, this Mongol uh, empire spreading into into the Middle East and and putting pressure on Islam. Okay. Okay. Um, another Khanate that came to power were the Shagatai uh, Khanate, located in Central Asia, led by Timur. Uh, Timur. Timur. Uh, we've talked about him before. Member of a prominent family of the Mongols, Shagatai Khanate Timur, through conquest, gained control over much of Central Asia and Iran. He consolidated the states of Sunni Islam as Orthodox, and his descendants, the Timurids, maintained his empire for nearly a century and founded the Mughai Empire in India. Uh, Timur took control of this land area in Central Asia and the Middle East and began a series of invasions. Um, we talked about the spread of ideas that, that can happen between rivals. Uh, 
and the influence of Islam began to spread into the Mongol Khanates. A man named Rashid al-Din was influential in its spread. And there's, of course, a statue of Rashid. If you're talking about enemies that are that are uh, influencing each other. Understand what understand the premise here. So who is who was Rashid al-Din? Advisor to the Ilkhan ruler Ghazan, who converted to Islam on Rashid's advice. So here's a, I mean, he converts to Islam, and this is this is remarkable. But understand again, um, the Mongols um, were tolerant of different religions. Uh, al Din was a Persian, uh, also Ghazan's prime minister. So he had the ear of the Mongol ruler and influenced him, and is partly responsible for the Mongols being influenced by Islam and in many cases of converting. So Rashid al Din, a huge part in that in that, uh, that part of uh, the uh, Mongols becoming um, uh, uh, Muslim. Okay, uh, so here's our map again. We, again, we see the size of, of, of the Mongol Empire. We see all the Khanates. And you, here's, the, here's the Il Khanate right here. Okay, and, the, and this is the empire of the Great Khan, the Sh uh, Sh Shagadai, uh, the Horde, the Golden Horde's up here, the White Horde. So all these, all these areas are, are under the control of a, of a certain ruler, but all part of the overall empire themselves. Okay, uh, so the merging of of Islam and Mongol culture resulted in some positive outcomes, including some very important historical writings, literature, mathematics, art, and astronomy. So their their you know their knowledge is being shared, uh, even though they're enemies. Uh, and a man named Nasir al-Din Tusi was a Persian philosopher, scientist, and mathematician. Uh, according to your book, a Persian mathematician and cosmologist whose academy near Tabitz provided a model for heavenly motions that helped to inspire the Copernican model of the solar system. To understand cosmologist is, is a person that studies the cosmos or the or the heavens, okay? Not, not a cosmetologist that cuts somebody's hair, okay? Um, okay, our next section in, in the book, regional responses in Western Eurasia. What benefits, it, what benefits resulted from the integration of Eurasia into the Mongol Empire? And we've talked about this already. Benefits, the Silk Roads were safe during the period of Mongol control. This, this was a, this is a huge thing because they hadn't been. And I don't think in that era they had uh, power lines like that picture does, but you get the idea. Um, okay, so of course, because the Silk Roads were safe, uh, everybody benefited from trade. And in, in the, because of that, the Mongol dominance grew because because they they were policing and, and keeping things safe. Trade grew, their their power and wealth grew, but so did everybody else's. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Russia and the Mongols. Uh, so this is an interesting part of their story. Uh, heavy devastation to Russia, perhaps more than in Persia. The Mongol conquest of Russia is called the Khanate of the Golden Horde. Uh, Mongols defeated the Russians, but did not occupy Russia. Why? They felt that Russia had little to offer, it had less developed economy, and it wasn't located along any major trade route. So Russia is interesting in the fact that it really is not uh, along a trade route. They're kind of uh, kind of by themselves also. So the Mongols defeat Russia in its empire known as the Kievan Rus. And we talked about them before. The Kievan Rus gave rise to the modern country Russia. Uh, but a result of the Mongol conquest was a decentralization of power away from Kiev. Uh, Alexander Nevsky, an important figure regarding the reduction of Kievan power. Uh, so according to your book, uh, the, the Prince of Novgorod, he submitted to the invading Mongols in 1240 and received recognition as the leader of the Russian princes under the Golden Horde. So he submits to the Mongols and then becomes a leader under the Golden Horde. Uh, he also encouraged other Novgorod princes to submit to the Mongols. Uh, 
this put him in good grace, graces of the Mongols. Uh, I'm not too sure how the how the Russians felt about it. Uh, as a result of this, the power base shifted from Kiev to Moscow, where, where it is today, of course. The, this new center would become the focus for Russia, become the dominant political center, and like I said, still is today. So although, although, conquered, although conquered by the Mongols, Russian language persisted. Um, one second here. As well as Russian customs and traditions, uh, there were huge declines in Russia because of Mongol exploitations on the other side. Um, huge declines. Why? Because of their cruelty, destructiveness, brutality, as seen in their their oppressive tax collecting. And we talked about this. Tax collecting has has been a horrifying, you know, practice in all of of human history. It's not like like it is today. It's 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 collecting tax at the you know, with an iron fist and being cruel to people uh, and collecting much more taxes than they probably owe. All of these ideas, all these things happening, cruelty, destructiveness, brutality, taxes led to a sharp decline in the Russian population. Uh, the, the Mongol Ivan III became an autocratic ruler and took the title of czar. So czar is a, is a term that we associate with Russia in our more modern times. Uh, this is where it starts. Uh, the Mongol Ivan III, also known as Ivan the Terrible. So what's a czar? Also spelled TZ or CZ. And the Latin word for Caesar. Okay, so it comes from the word from Caesar. This Russian title for a monarch was first used in reference to a Russian ruler by Ivan III. Uh, Okay, so an autocratic ruler was an autocracy, a country, state, or society governed by one person with absolute power, exercising a dominating rule or control. So you're talking about a, you know, a dictator, a totalitarian kind of government, where one person decides what everyone's going to do, whether you like it or not. Um, okay, but as the Golden Horde eventually uh, declined, it gave rise to a Russian autocracy. Uh, the gradual decline of Mongol influence resulted in the beginning of some modern day countries and the rise of Lithuania and Serbia. But more importantly, in that era, uh, you have the rise of the very powerful Ottoman Empire. So out of the all the going ons here, the Ottoman Empire rise. And this will be a, an empire that will last for a very, very long time. So who was the Ottoman Empire? According to your book, Islamic State, founded by Osman in northwestern Anatolia around 1300, after the fall of the Byzantine Empire. We talked about this before the Ottoman Empire steps in. The Ottoman Empire was based at Istanbul, which was, as we mentioned before, formerly Constantinople from 1453 to 1922, so less than 100 years ago. They were still uh, a relevant power. Uh, 500 years they were in power. It encompassed lands in the Middle East, the Caucasus, and Eastern Europe. Okay. Um, okay, so let me uh, go on to part two here. Of, just stay with me here. Part, part two of chapter 12, the end of chapter 12. Uh, the next section in our book is Mongol domination in China, 1271 to 1368. How did Mongol rule in China foster cultural and scientific exchange? So as the Mongols took control of North China, they changed their policy. Instead of leveling all the cities that were, that were very populated and to create pasture for livestock and land for agriculture, they, they changed their point of view. They determined that heavy taxation of the people would be more profitable. So let's not kill them all. Let's uh, get all their money, okay? Uh, and the Chinese suffered under this oppressive system. So life under Mongol rule was not a picnic. It was harsh, violent, and unforgiving. Uh, back to the Yuan dynasty um, under Mongol rule. A period of time when China was under the rule of the Mongol empires. Uh, uh, the the Yuan ruled China from 1279 to 1368 to be followed by the Ming dynasty that we'll talk about here. Uh, the Chinese had fought with the Mongol tribes of the north for hundreds of years, but when the Mongols united under the leadership of Genghis Khan, they swept across northern China, destroying many cities along the way. 
uh, and the Mongols and the Chinese continued to fight for many years until Kublai Khan, Genghis's grandson, took control, and he eventually conquered much of China, including the Song and Jin empires, and he established his own Chinese dynasty that we've already talked about called the Yuan, the Yuan dynasty. Um, uh, Kublai took on much of the culture of the Chinese, but all of the, though the Mongols were great warriors, they didn't know how to run a large empire. We've heard this how many times? <laughs> uh, so Kublai used Chinese officials to run the government. So think about that. You conquer the people, but you put them in charge of running it. So that's a, that's a pretty uh, risky idea. So he kept a very close eye on them, never quite trusting his former enemy. And what the result was, was a systemized government that had more benefits for people in the cities than in the countryside. Uh, Kubla encouraged trade and communications with lands beyond China. Of course, trade's what it's all about. Trade routes, uh, also key to Mongol success was his protection of the trade routes, keep them safe so they keep on flowing with goods because goods make you money, goods make you wealthy. He also brought in people from all around the world and encouraged science and culture. You not, so not exactly a stereotype of what we typically think of when we think of Mongols. Uh, one of his most famous visitors, and we've talked about Marco Polo before. So Marco Polo came to China while Kublai Khan ruled the Yuan Empire. Uh, Kublai permitted freedom of religion, like I said before, including Confucianism, Islam, Buddhism. Uh, Beijing became his capital, ancient Beijing. Uh, the center of culture, economics, and politics. According to your book, China's northern capital first used as an imperial capital in 906, and now is the capital of the People's Republic of China. I'm talking about today, okay? Uh, so to keep control of his Chinese subjects, Kublai instituted social classes. And here you, here you see them here, of course, the Mongols at the top. Central Asian nomadic and Muslim allies next, then the Northern Chinese, then the Han Chinese and, and the minority people of the South. So like any other uh, pyramid maybe we've seen in different different cultures, they're all pretty much the same. The, the ruling, the, the very small handful of people, the ruling elite at the top make all the money. So we institute social classes to control the, the Chinese subjects. Um, um, the Mongols made it the highest class. They were always given preference. Uh, and then below the Mongols were the non-Chinese races, such as Muslims and, and the Turks. At the bottom were the Chinese and the Southern Song were considered to be the lowest class. Uh, part of the Chinese culture continued to flourish during the Yuan Dynasty. Um, Yuan rulers encourage advancement in technology and transportation. They also encourage arch, arts such as ceramics, painting, and drama. So Kublai Khan began a new era in China. The Yuan Dynasty enjoyed Chinese culture so much that he moved the Mongolian capital to China, but he excluded the Chinese from serving in high government offices and relied on foreigners to serve in his government. Um, but, but over time, the Mongols became more like the Chinese. Uh, there were only a small percentage of the overall population, like most ruling classes, the majority. So there wasn't, they, they weren't, of course, the majority. Um, some Mongols, however, attempted to retain their own culture, continue with their base, base culture, continue to live in tents, only married other Mongols. Uh, but of course, what goes up must come down. We have the fall of the Yuan. When Kublai died, the, the, the Yuan declined. There were frequent uprisings due to heavy taxes and corruption. So again, that tax collecting, that oppressive tax collecting, people are gonna, people are gonna, gonna fight back, okay? A, a, a peasant leader named Zhu Yuanzheng uh, created a rebel army and toppled the Mongols. Uh, the population of China shrunk under Mongol rule and weakened the uh, internal strife, weakened the Yuan Empire. So the, the Yuan dynasty was the shortest lived of all the major Chinese dynasties. After Kublai Khan's death, the dynasty weakened and heirs of Kublai uh, began to fight over power and the government became corrupt. Uh, 
Chinese rebel groups began to form to fight against the Mongol rule in 1368. A Buddhist monk named Zhu Yuanzhen uh, led the rebels to overthrow the Yuan, and he then establishes the Ming dynasty. So we're moving into the next empire here. So we're going from the Yuan to the Ming, okay? Uh, next part of your book is the early Ming Empire. In what ways did the Ming Empire continue or discontinue Mongol practices? So Ming China, and you know, many people know, uh, have heard of the Ming more than most of these other other um, empires, especially in the in China. Um, the Ming Dynasty was a series of rebellions that finally drove out the Mongols, uh, and, and the, the the ruler was Zhu Yuanzheng. In southern China, he found the Ming, or, or another way of saying it, is the brilliant dynasty. So the Ming is often called the last of the great Chinese dynasties. Uh, they ruled ancient China from 1368 to 1644, so nearly 300 years. Uh, they had an anti-Mongol point of view, but adopted many of the Yuan government policies. According to your book, the Ming Empire, empire based in China that Zhu Yuanzhang uh, established after the overthrow of the Yuan Empire. Uh, the Ming Emperor Yunghua sp sponsored the building of the Forbidden City in the voyages of Zheng He. Later years of the Ming saw a slowdown in technological advancement and economic downcline. I'm sorry, not downcline, decline. Okay. Today, we, we know of the Ming Empire because of their valuable vases or vases, or everyone said, I'm not sure how I would say it. Uh, these, these very, very valuable vases were made from a very fine, very thin porcelain. This is, the, this is where the idea of, of, of Chinese, uh, I'm sorry, of fine china comes from. It's, it's these very thin uh, vases um, and that, 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 that's taken on the name of called Fine China. Uh, so as we know, prior to the Ming Dynasty, China had been ruled by the Yuan and set up by the Mongols who had conquered China 100 years earlier. Uh, many Chinese did not like the Mongols and considered them the enemy. But finally, the Mongols were overthrown and ousted from, by, from China by a peasant uprising led by Zhu Yuanzhang. Uh, he took control of China and named himself emperor. Uh, uh, Emperor Hong Wu, and this is the beginning of the Ming Dynasty. So again, another complicated name changes his name again. So Zhu uh, Yuanzhang becomes Hong Wu. Okay. Um, this is an era of large civil engineering projects. Uh, the China, the, the Great Wall of China, completely rebuilt during the Ming Dynasty tall and wide brick walls that are still standing today were built by the Ming. Uh, the Grand Canal also rebuilt. So we've talked about this is the third time, but you know, hundreds of years are going by and things fall in disrepair. All these being rebuilt during the Ming um, era. Um, the, 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 the Ming had a significant impact on trade and helped the economy to flourish. Uh, the city was called the Forbidden City, and this was the emperor's palace and was located inside the capital city of Beijing. It had almost a thousand buildings and covered 185 acres of land. So why was it called the Forbidden City? I mean, not, not actually a city at all. Uh, it was the imperial palace complex in Beijing. Uh, from which the Chinese emperors ruled their empire for centuries. Uh, it was called the Forbidden City because it was forbidden um, for commoners or even uninvited uh, nobility to, to enter its sacred precinct. Okay. okay, let's take a break here and watch the film entitled The Forbidden City. Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so art. And culture flourishes during the Ming, literature, painting, music, poetry, porcelain. Again, that fine china Ming vases made of blue and white porcelain were prized at the time throughout the world. And like I mentioned before, still considered quite valuable today. If you can find a Ming, Ming vase or vase, you, you, you just made some money. 
Uh, literature reached new heights during the Ming. Great classical novels of Chinese literature were written during the Ming Dynasty. Uh, centralized bureaucracy, civil service exam system. So again, that's an indication of, of you know, a, a knowledgeable um, a government that doesn't want to just put anybody in a position of power. You had to be qualified for the job, no longer given as a favor. They set up a national school system, ran large numbers of factories and workshops. And I mentioned before, improvement of the Grand Canal, that, that shipping lane across China, as well as the, um, the Great Wall. Uh, so the Ming government was run by an organization called the Civil Service. Sounds familiar. Of course, we have this today our, in our government. Uh, applicants have to take difficult exams. Uh, men with the highest scores would get the best job. So you had to study for years, in, in the case of the Ming, to try and pass the exams and earn one of these prestigious positions. Uh, exams often covered a number of subjects, but a significant portion of the testing was on the teachings of Confucius. Uh, the, the Ming used men who were eunuchs. So what does that mean? It means that it's a man who been, has been castrated, been sterilized. They could not produce a family, could not potentially challenge the dynasty someday. So you want to, you know, servants that were around the the family, especially women, if, if the servants were men, they were sterilized so they would not, you know, interact with women and, and create a, a an offspring that wasn't, um, you know, from that from the family itself. Uh, the Emperor Shenzhou, uh, the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty, responsible for the rebuilding and the rebirth we just spoke about, the Wall, the Canal, the, the Forbidden City, but also establishing trade and diplomacy with other, um, you know, uh, trade partners. Uh, he also changed his name. <laughs> okay. Uh, he later would become known as Yongla, uh, the the emperor. So who was Yong La? The third emperor of the Ming Empire. He sponsored the building of the Forbidden City, a huge encyclopedia project, the exhibitions of Zheng He, and the reopening of China's borders to trade and travel. <clears throat> so who is Zheng He? <clears throat> Great Chinese explorer, uh, set out at the command of Emperor Shenzhou, visited many lands of the world with, his, with the Chinese Navy to establish maritime commerce, uh, traveled throughout Southeast Asia, the Middle East, even to Africa, visits, visits, uh, visiting Somalia in Africa. He actually brought back a giraffe from Africa for the emperor. <clears throat> so according to your book, Zheng He, a eunuch, this is a man that had been sterilized um, to, to not potentially create offspring that wasn't wanted, not in the lines of, of power. Uh, imperial eunuch and Muslim entrusted by the Ming Emperor Yongla with a series of state voyages that took his gigantic ships through the Indian Ocean from Southeast Asia <clears throat> to Africa. Okay, okay next section is uh, centralization and militarism in East Asia, 1200 to 1500. Uh, what are some of the similarities and differences in how Korea and Japan <clears throat> responded to the Mongol threat? <clears throat> So we talked about these three countries before, just recently, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, and how they were affected by the Mongol hordes. Uh, Korea <clears throat> was soundly defeated and put under Mongol control, while Japan and Vietnam mostly escaped the Mongols. So, so Korea, not so lucky. The, the Mongols occupied Korea. Uh, <clears throat> the brilliant general Yi Song-yi set up the, the uh, Chosun dynasty, also called the Chosun dynasty. Yi reduced Buddhist influence and set up a government based upon Confucian principles. With a few generations, Confucianism had made a deep <clears throat> impact on Korean life. <clears throat> okay, so the Chosun, the Chosun, uh, or the Joseon, again, lots of different names here. A Korean state founded by Tajo Yi Song Yi that lasted for approximately five centuries from 1392 to 1897. Okay. Uh, the the Chosun dynasty, again, also known as the as the Joseon dynasty or Yi dynasty, 
Uh, they, they ruled over a united Korean peninsula for more than 500 years, 1392 to 1897. So according to your book, The Chosun, the, the Chosun, uh, the Chosun Dynasty ruled Korea from the fall of Korea Kingdom to the colonization of Korea by Japan. Uh, King, King Tejo declared himself the founder of the kingdom of, of the great Joseon or Chosun. Joseon, okay? uh, the Mongols used Korea as a base on the coast for invasions elsewhere. Also to dominate and control the maritime trading routes. So of course, dominate and control means take over and and get money for 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 trade ships coming by. You've got to pay your way. Uh, cultural innovations and achievements of Korea's last dynasty continue to influence society in modern day Korea even today. <clears throat> uh, Yi Sung Gi. 1392, General Yi took the throne and the name of King Tajo. Uh, Tojo, you might hear it. You might hear it pronounced. Uh, the first few years of Tajo's rule dissatisfied nobles regularly, and they and they threatened to mutiny because of that. Uh, to show up his power, uh, Tajo declared himself the founder of the Kingdom of the Great Joseon, and wiped out rebellious members of the old dynasty's clan. Uh, King Tajo also signaled a fresh start by moving the capital to the present day city known in Korea as Seoul, okay? Uh, he built architectural wonders in the new capital, uh, including the Gyeongwuk Palace and the Cheongdyuk Palace, uh, 1395 and 1405, these buildings still stand. Uh, King Tajo uh, ruled until 1408, and uh, the Joseon culture and power reached a new pinnacle under Tajo's great-grandson, King Sejong the Great. Uh, cultural center, research center, uh, movies, TV shows, talking about, you know, uh, uh, in, in uh, Korea that, that are uh, currency stamps that are named after him. Um, very popular, uh, like a George Washington might be to, to Americans. Um, it was said he was so wise that even as a young young boy, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that his two older brothers stepped aside so he could be king because he was so smart. <clears throat> 1592 and 1597, the Japanese used their samurai army to attack Joseon, Korea. The ultimate goal was to conquer Ming, China. Uh, the victorious Japanese cut off the ears and noses of more than 38,000 Korean victims. <clears throat> Uh, and Korean slaves revolted against their masters to join the invaders. So the Korean slaves revolted against the Koreans to join uh, the Japanese in their in their raid, burning everything down. Uh, the Ming the Ming Dynasty in China was was weakened by the effort of fighting off the Japanese, and it soon fell to the Manchu State of China, and the Qing Dynasty was established. Okay, looking at Japan, uh, world of ancient Japan. So after securing Korea, the Mongols turned towards Japan. So I mentioned before that out of the three, uh, uh, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, Korea falls, but the other two don't. But the, but the, of course, the Mongols are going to try. They, they turn towards Japan, and they have a huge, overwhelming army in 1274. Um, the Mongols were successful at first with their invasion of Japan, uh, but a freak storm forced them back to mainland uh, Korea. Okay, so let's do a supplemental lecture right here. Number 13, we'll call this kamikaze. Uh, so I'm not talking about the drink here. We're talking about this idea that, that that's very, uh, very Japanese. Most Americans would know it as kamikaze uh, uh, fighter pilots in World War II. But here's our, our Outlined intro Mongol invasions of the 13th century is where the word kamikaze comes from, although we've, we, we mostly know it from the pilots of World War II. Number two, the Mongols had two invasions of Japan, and it started over, over pirates. Uh, the results, both invasions averted by storms. How's that possible? And you have what's called the divine wind or the kamikaze. <clears throat> 
the relevance, the divine wind is a legend of shared courage and resistance, a devastating force that would answer the, their country's prayers and turn back any invaders. This is what the suicide bombers of World War II thought when they, when they took on the title of kamikaze. They were the modern version of that. But the idea and, and the, the idea of kamikaze goes back to the Mongol invasion of Japan in the era that we're talking about. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So, so kamikaze or divine wind. Uh, for, for years, the Japanese speak of the divine wind that saved Japan from Mongol invasion, and we're going to talk about that here in this in this lecture. Uh, these these failed invasions cost the Mongols a lot of men and money. This began the decline of the Mongol Empire. So, the fact that they could not conquer Japan ultimately led to the Mongols going into decline. Okay. Uh, so, so kamikaze, what is that? Divine wind, which the Japanese credited with blowing the Mongol invaders away from their shores in 1281. So you have these two invasions, both were, both were, uh, came to an end because of, of a freak storm, very unusual. Uh, so the Japanese avoided being conquered by the Mongols, and this would eventually result in the decline of the Mongol Empire. So in the in the 1270s and 1280s, uh, the, the menacing forces of the Mongols attacked Japan. And, and truly, through courage, determination, good luck, the Japanese drove them off. And again, the inspiration for future generations of Japanese right after World War II, using this name for their kamikaze pilots in World War II. These pilots would sacrifice their lives, would fly planes into a ship and, and die with the crash to, to disrupt the their enemies, in most cases in World War II, was the Americans uh, try to blow up their ship or take out a you know a couple planes or whatever it might be. But but they they would sacrifice their lives for the cause, um, crashing into a strategic location of the enemy. Like I said, usually a ship at sea hit the command center, whatever it might be. So it was an honor to be a kamikaze pilot. Your family lived in honor for the rest of their lives. But again, it didn't, the war didn't start here. It started in the 13th century during the, during the Mongol invasions of Japan. <clears throat> so back to Kublai, Kublai Khan. In the 1260s, the Mongols under Kublai Khan were sweeping across East Asia, taking on the Song Chinese. Um, they proved to be an intimidating and unrelenting military force, as we've seen. Uh, <clears throat> but as he was fighting the Chinese, Kubla had his eye on Japan. So in 1266, he wrote to the Japanese court demanding that they accept him as their overlord. And he, and he had no qualms about backing it up with violence, saying, or who would prefer to resort, resort to war? So you, you make me overlord, or we're going to go to war with you. And, and, and we destroy everybody. So trying to intimidate the Japanese. However, tensions between the Japanese and the Mongols did not just come from Mongol aggression. Japanese pirates <coughs> excuse me, also played a role in the conflict between the two. Uh, pirates were a reoccurring problem in the seas around Japan, and they showed no respect for borders that nations tried to impose. So the pirates were a mixture of Japanese, Korean, and Chinese sailors, and they robbed wherever they thought they could get away with it. So. While Japan was struggling to keep law and order in its country, the pirates were ignored. I mean, the officials were busy with the nation's internal problems, and they turned a blind eye to what the Japanese pirates were doing. Uh, so Kublai Khan uh, contacted the Japanese, asking them to deal with the pirate problem, and they failed to address the issue, so his demands escalated. Uh, Japan's ruling class was riddled with tensions. Uh, although the emperor reigned over the country, he did not rule it. We talked about the shogun, the shogunate. So, the, so rule fell to the shogun, a military dictator who governed. There were also tensions between noble clans and their samurai warriors, both competing for land in a position within a nation uh, whose government had shown it, respect, it respected strength more than the rule of the law. So of course, Japan's got a lot in their plate. And we're not worried about pirates. Uh, so the issues degenerated into the Mongols launching an invasion against, against Japan. 
and they did this by recruiting soldiers from subservient, so like Korea. So Korea is now subservient to them, and they're under under the thumb. And if you're Korean, you, you're going to be forced to go fight for the Mongols now, and they're going to you're going to go fight and attack Japan. Uh, so we're recruiting soldiers from subservient Korea. Uh, Kubla vastly increased the size of his invasion force by by doing that. So immense numbers of troops were crammed into hundreds of boats and they set sail for Japan. And initially Mongol forces uh, were overcoming Japanese resistance. The invasion reached the mainland. Uh, but but the two nations had a very had different ways of fighting. Japanese warfare laid great emphasis on individual courage and skill. Kind of an offshoot of a kamikaze. Uh, honor. The Mongols use enormous amounts of troops packed together in groups. They would come at you, they would fire swarms of arrows, you know, hurled out of these formations that would they fire up in the air and they come down on, on their opponents, you know, arrows rain out of the sky. Uh, and they do this in this war and, 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 and they have the upper hand initially, fire bombs flung from catapults, at the Japanese. Uh, this is not fighting as the samurai knew it, uh, but the Japanese adapted to the threat and their fighting skills turned the war against the Mongols and their massed uh, ranks of Chinese and Korean soldiers. So they have, they have their own uh, Korean soldiers too, uh, forced the Mongols to make a tactical withdrawal, returning to their boats. Uh, as they set sail, a storm came in, damaging the fleet and damaging it immensely, and many and many ships sunk and many many men died. Um, so this this signaled the end of this first invasion. It was over. Of course, the threat remained, but this is the this a storm came out of nowhere and and, and turned the Mongol hordes back. This is this is Japanese legend here. But Kublai wasn't done. 1279, he plans a second invasion of Japan. Uh, but the Japanese had been busy. They they knew they were coming back. Uh, they, they knew the Mongols would return in force. They had built strong defenses against them, including an extensive stone wall along the coastline. So the Mongol fleet set sail in 1281. It was even larger than the first one, better prepared than the first one. The Japanese harassed the fleet before it reached their coast, trying to anyway. Uh, Trying to do anything to slow down this this onslaught that's coming. Uh, nighttime raids by bands of Japanese men in small ships made life difficult for the Mongols. Uh, in one dramatic encounter, 30 samurai swam to a Mongol ship, climbed aboard, defeated the crew, cut off all their heads, and then swam away. Uh, and that brings to mind the old adage, quit while you're ahead. That was awful. Okay, this was res this resulted in, in a decline in Mongol morale. Of course, you get your head cut off, you might lose your morale, you, you might lose your 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 bravery. Uh, but but besides that, besides these you know kind of harassing uh, groups of Japanese that came out to slow them down, it's also hot. The summer sun's blazing down on the Mongols and their Chinese forces while they're laying off the coast because they're afraid to come to come ashore. Um, so the so the second invasion is not going so well, um, and they're so they're they're offshore, this miserable confined existence, screaming hot, you're, it's blazing hot. So not exactly the glorious invasion that they had uh, promised. Okay, it did, didn't work out again. As this as the end of summer approached, typhoon season came. Uh, um, so there's a, there's a there's the uh, map of the second. A Mongol invasion, uh, and much larger, uh, much larger troops in the first time, uh, 23,000 the first time, 150,000 the second time. So uh, much, uh, much more sure to victory. But there they are off the coast, uh, a little bit intimidated to come in. It's blazing hot, and then a typhoon hits. That's a actual satellite picture of an actual typhoon. Um, so August 15th, a terrible storm descended upon the fleet, far more devastating than the storm that struck the previous invasion. It smashed the Mongol ships and scattered those that remained, and they were finished. Uh, 
so this idea of the divine went, uh, this uh, this idea of kamikaze, your divine went. And so this is an answer to their, to their prayers. Clans usually competed against each other, but the Japanese came together. This is important. This is a very honor honorable moment in Japanese history, and one that's looked looked back on proudly. Clans come together that were that were competing against each other to repel the Mongol invaders. On both occasions, the Japanese were held greatly when the Mongol fleet was destroyed by powerful typhoons or hurricanes. The Japanese called these kamikazes or divine winds. Um, in answer to their prayers, the Mongol invasion force had been destroyed, and the Mongols would never again come close to invading Japan. So the defeat of the Mongols by the kamikaze was an iconic moment. Uh, the attempted Mongol invasion and its end helped to shape Japan to become what it became. Uh, Buddhist shrines associated with the divine intervention grew in prestige, brought together by the external threat from the Mongols. The samurai cooperated in a way that had not, they had not done for years, and this all brought a period of relative unity. Okay, so, so the the legend of the divine win, a 13th century war, was remembered in the 20th century due to due to the divine wind of the kamikaze. Okay, and lastly, the relevance of the lecture: the divine wind is a legend of shared courage and resistance, a devastating force that would answer their country's prayers and turn back any invaders. This is what the suicide bombers of World War II thought when they took on the title of kamikaze. They were the modern version of that. Okay? And that is the end of that supplemental lecture number 13. Okay, so we're moving on from there. Okay, the Ashikaga shogunate led a revolt of the Bushi that overthrew the Kamakura regime and established the Ashikoga shogunate. Uh, so who are the who are the Bushi? Bushi Bushi, um, pronounced both ways. Um, probably the pronounce uh, the the correct pronunciation is Bushi. Uh, they were the military nobility of medieval and early modern Japan. Uh, 1333, 1388, the emperor, the emperor Godego tried to reclaim power from the shoguns, but was defeated by the Ashikaga shogunate. Uh, so he starts a civil war in Japan. Um, and, but he's defeated, and the, this leads to the dissolution of the Kamakuri, Kamakura shogunate. Uh, Ashikaga uh, it, then it, it takes rise of, of the Ashikaga shogunate, uh, according to your book. The second of Japan's military governments headed by shogun, sometimes called the Muromachi shogunate. Uh, okay, our, our last country is Vietnam. And we're still talking about ancient Vietnam here. So Vietnam was known um, as Annam by the Chinese. <clears throat> they, they also avoided being conquered by the Mongols, um, but were forced to pay tribute to the Yuan Empire when they were under Mongol rule. So how did they avoid being conquered? Mostly because the Mongols were focused elsewhere. You know, they had a lot on their plate. They'd been, they got beat up in, in Japan pretty badly. So they they perhaps so let's just, let's let's go somewhere else. So you perhaps the Vietnamese um, dodged dodged a bullet. Okay, okay. We talked about about champa rice in in uh, Vietnam, the rice that could be harvested uh, twice in one year. So the champa were a people also. They were conquered by Annam or Vietnam in this era. Uh, they established a state based on Confucianism. So 1500 is the start of the modern day Vietnam that we that we know today. Okay. All right. That is the end of chapter 12. Thank you.